Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Recovering Stress Data with SimCenter Nastran. My name is Jonathan Hill. I'm an engineer here at ATA Engineering's Northern Virginia office. I'm going to be with you to give a quick intro to ATA and a little background, uh, and then I'm going to pass things over to Andy in San Diego uh, for our feature presentation. So just to start off, today's pre presentation is being recorded. It'll be available to review uh, probably tomorrow on both our YouTube page as well as on our software website under the free resources. In addition, everyone's been muted for now, but I invite you to stick around until the very end when we'll have a question and answer session. Um, and at that point, we'll have some instructions on how to ask questions and unmute yourself at that time. You can also ask questions through the chat at any time. Just note that we'll probably wait until the very end to loop back and actually answer those questions as well. So just for a quick intro to ATA, ATA is well known for providing high value engineering services where we have expertise in design, analysis, and test. We're really excited to help our customers overcome their product design challenges across a range of industries, just some of which are shown here. We're also able to leverage that project experience and expertise through our role as a Siemens partner and value added reseller. In this role, we can support a number of products, including SimCenter and Astrian, which we'll be talking about more today, uh, but also others like FEMAP, NX, SimCenter 3D, and Star CCM+. We host a technical support hotline that's available by phone or through our web browser, and that's staffed by engineers who are using this software every day. And that hotline is open um, all day long, whether you're on the East Coast or the West Coast. And then finally, we offer um, a number of um, SimCenter and Astrian and FEMAP courses. Um, and I also like to point out that we actually developed the official SimCenter and Astrian training materials for Siemens. Finally, I just would like to invite you to check out our website after the presentation today. Um, we have some product information, uh, but really my favorite part is the free resources. We have a lot of great stuff up there, uh, white papers, APIs, um, on-demand videos, tutorials, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of great content, and I'd invite you to check this out after today's presentation. Again, we'll also have the recording available probably tomorrow for you to review as well. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Andy. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar on stress data recovery with SimCenter Nastran. In this webinar, we will be looking to explain the difference between nodal and elemental stress results. And the reason this is important is because we all know how easy it is to flip back and forth between nodal and elemental stress results in the post-processor. But understanding how the solver is reporting stress output is crucial in determining whether you are looking at the correct stress result. And it's also crucial in really answering the question, is the post-processor giving me the stress result I think it's giving me? So first, it's wise to remind ourselves of how stress is computed for a node or an element. So in finite element theory, stress is computed at the Gauss points, whereas displacement is computed at the nodes. And the number of Gauss points is determined by the type, shape, and order of the element. So you can see in the image on the right, we have two different shaped elements. We have a triangle element and a quad element. And we're also showing the linear and parabolic form for each of these shapes. So you can see that depending on the shape and order of the element, we get a different number of Gauss points. So when you're looking at elemental stress results, what you're getting is a stress that is computed from the Gauss point stresses. Whereas when you're looking at nodal stress results, you're getting an extrapolated stress result. Because what happens there is that the Gauss point stresses are extrapolated to the nodes, and that's how you're able to obtain nodal stress results. So in SimCenter NASTRAN on the stress output request card, you have the option of choosing either center or corner stress output. Center stress output is the SimCenter NASTRAN default, and that will output stress at the center of the element only. Whereas in the case of corner stress output, that's going to output stress at the center of the element and at the nodes. So when, when you request corner stress output, NASTRAN is going ahead and computing that extrapolated nodal stress for you and making that available. The one caveat to mention with respect to corner stress is linear triangle elements. In the case of linear triangles, even if you request corner stress, NASTRAN will only give you center stress results. And the other point to mention here is that for parabolic elements, both center and corner stress is output by default. So you don't have to be as particular 
about requesting center versus corner when it comes to parabolic elements because it's going to give you both by default. But in general, you're encouraged to use corner stress output in order for proper viewing of elemental and nodal stress results in the post-processor. Because if you happen to look at nodal stress results with, say, the center stress output request, that can lead to inaccurate stress predictions. And we can demonstrate that here in this example, where we have a plate with a hole in it, and we're constraining the left-hand side and applying a load on the right-hand side. So it's fairly trivial in this case to compute our nominal stress and use Peterson's stress concentration factors handbook to find our stress concentration factor for this specific geometry. And then we can compute our theoretical max stress value of 289 PSI. And you can see in the two images on the right, the top image shows our result using a center output request, and the bottom image shows the result using a corner output request. And you can see in the center output request case, we get a predicted stress of 249 PSI, which is below our theoretical prediction. And in the case of the corner stress request, we get a max stress of 289 PSI, which matches our theoretical prediction. So what happened here is that with the center stress request, stress was only reported at the center of those elements around the perimeter of our hole. So we weren't really getting a stress result at the edge of the hole. We were getting a stress result that was slightly offset from the edge of the hole. Whereas with the corner stress request, the extrapolated stresses at the edge of the hole were computed and made available to us in the post-processor, thereby allowing us to report the peak stress at the edge of the hole and obtain an accurate stress prediction. So this is really a warning and reminder of the potential danger of requesting center stress output when we should have been requesting corner stress output. So what are the default stress output request options in SimCenter 3D and FEMAP? Well, in SimCenter 3D, the default is the center output request option, as it is in SimCenter NASTRAN, whereas the default for FEMAP is the corner output request stress option. So if you wanted to change the default stress data recovery location from to be corner instead of center in SimCenter 3D, the steps to do so are outlined on this slide. And I'm not going to go through these steps in great detail. This is really here for your later reference. But to summarize, you would first want to locate the template folder in your NX installation directory, and you would want to open one of two template files, depending on whether you were dealing with English or metric units. And with this template file open, you would create a new solution, edit the case control output request, and change your default from center to corner. Then you would delete that solution, and your structural output request would be saved as a modeling object. You would then save and close the template file, and then once you reopen NX, you would find that your default stress output request location would be corner. So with this insight into how to appropriately request nodal and elemental stress results, what then is the proper way to report nodal and elemental stress? Well, the three most common methods are nodal peak, nodal average, and element centroidal. So in the case of nodal peak, that's reporting the peak nodal stress from each contributing element. In the case of nodal average, that's reporting the average of all elemental input for each node. And in the case of element centroidal, that's reporting the average of the Gauss point stresses. Now, this definition of element centroidal stress is a bit of a simplification. In general, solvers use the elemental shape functions to compute the centroidal stress. So a more general definition for element centroidal would be that it's a calculated value that is interpolated by the software and not a pure average of the Gauss point stresses. But the exact definition is really dependent on the solver. And you might hear some people refer to the element centroidal stress as the unaveraged elemental stress. And what they mean when they say unaveraged is that there is no averaging occurring from any adjacent elements, as element centroidal is seen as the pure elemental result. So if you look at the image in the bottom right, we have a node surrounded by four elements. Now this node has four values associated with it, W, X, Y, and Z which represent each element's extrapolated nodal stress at the shared center node. And in the table, we have the calculation for nodal peak and nodal average. Nodal peak is simply the max across W, X, Y, and Z, and nodal average is simply the average across W, X, Y, and Z. 
As for the contour settings to use in FEMAP to achieve nodal peak, nodal average, and element centroidal contours, those dialog, back, dialog box settings are shown here on this slide. For nodal peak, you'd want to be sure to select nodal max value and use corner data. For nodal average, you would want to select nodal average and use corner data. And for element centroidal, you would want to select elemental no averaging and you would want to uncheck use corner data. And you can also achieve these same settings in FEMAP's post-processing toolbox. So the post-processing toolbox settings to use to achieve nodal peak, nodal average, and element centroidal stress contours are shown on this slide. For nodal peak, you would set the type to nodal and data conversion to maximum value. For nodal average, you would use nodal and average. And for elements and centroidal, you would change the type to elemental. And for data conversion, you would select no average centroid only. Similarly, the contour settings to use in SimCenter 3D to achieve nodal peak, nodal average, and elements and centroidal stress plots are shown on this slide. For nodal average, one comment to make is if you look at that dialog box in the middle, there are these average across settings. And those settings are really mesh dependent and could be the topic of its own webinar. But the main thing to note here is that if you uncheck the box, that's turning off averaging across that feature. So you can see in this example next to PID or property ID, I have that box unchecked. So that means SimCenter 3D will not be averaging across different property IDs on my mesh. And for elements in Troido, one thing to note is that in this dialog box here, I'm showing the settings to use for the stress element nodal result type. But you could also achieve elements in Troido plots by choosing the stress elemental result type and setting result combination to none. So to conclude, when would you use nodal versus elemental stress results? Well, in general, nodal peak is always more conservative than nodal average. So that's something to consider first and foremost. And then as to when you might use element centroidal, element centroidal is less conservative, but it may be required if you have a specific allowable correlated to this stress type. So for example, element size correlated allowables. So for those that aren't familiar with what I'm describing here, sometimes it's necessary to use a combination of test data and FEA trade studies to derive allowables. And what occurs is that you might be given test data that provides you with, say, temperature-dependent properties for a material. Well, you can then use those properties and build an FE model of the exact coupon geometry used in the test, and then apply a series of loads and vary your temperature, and you can arrive at the failure loads and allowables for that specific material. But in order to use these derived allowables from your FEA coupon studies, you need to construct a mesh using the same elements and the same element size as was used in the trade studies, and you need to pull the same stress result as you pull to compute the allowable. So for example, elements and troidal stress. So that's what I mean when I say that you might be required to use elements and troidal if that was the result type used to determine the allowable. And lastly, when assessing fatigue, nodal results are often used because in the case of fatigue, you're interested in determining the maximum stress that your component is going to see during its lifetime. And for strength assessment, nodal or elemental results could be used depending on the required fidelity of your analysis and the design stage you're in. So to close, there were two other things I wanted to note that are related to this topic. The first of those is that comparing different stress result types is one means of evaluating convergence. And that's because the difference between nodal peak and nodal average stress decreases as the mesh size is reduced. And that's the direct result of the elements gauss points moving closer to the nodes. So as a result, comparing nodal peak with nodal average results can be used as a convergence criterion. And you can see in this example here, I have a plate with three different mesh sizes. We have one inch elements, half inch elements, and quarter inch elements. In all three test cases, I'm constraining on the left-hand side of the plate and applying a point load on the right-hand side. And for all three cases, I looked at nodal peak and nodal average for the same node. And you can see in my plot on the bottom right, as the mesh size decreases, the difference between my nodal peak and nodal average stress also decreases. And that's the direct result of the Gauss points moving closer and closer to the nodes 
as we reduce the mesh size and converge on our exact solution. So as those Gauss points are moving closer and closer to the nodes, there's less, less of an extrapolation occurring. And lastly, I also wanted to mention the nodal average stress calculation in SimCenter 3D versus VMAP. The nodal average stress calculation is handled slightly differently in SimCenter 3D and VMAP. In the case of SimCenter 3D, it first averages the component stresses at each node before computing the von Mises stress at the node, whereas with VMAP, it first computes the von Mises stress from the component stresses, and then it averages those von Mises stress values at each node. So the order of operations differs, which is important to note if you're ever trying to compare SimCenter 3D nodal average stress results with FEMAP nodal average stress results. So that concludes today's webinar, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass control back to Jonathan, who will open the floor to any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Andy. So I've updated the settings for the meeting so that now you can um, unmute your phone if you're interested in um, submitting a question that way. Um, we have instructions on the screen, whether you're in the web interface or the Zoom application itself, on where to unmute. Um, note that if you're in the actual Zoom application, the unmute button isn't in the screen share window. It's on the separate kind of meeting window. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat now. So we'd love to get your questions. We had a question come in. How does the corner option affect composite element results? Yeah, that is definitely a specific case. I know it'll be dependent on whether you're dealing with a bending problem or perhaps just an in-plane shear. Um, I would most likely have to, I, I would want to um, type a formal response to give to do that question justice. So if we can take down that caller's con contact information, I can get back to him with a more definite answer. Okay, sure. We got a additional question in the chat. It says, I'm on a project using strain gauges which measure strain on the surface of the model. What do you recommend to get the strains on the surface? I think again, I'll likely follow up with an email. I'll talk to some of our engineers on strain output versus stress output. They're very closely related because first you'll converge on your nodal, or excuse me, your displacement results. And then from displacements you get strain and then from strain you get stress. Um, so the convergence behavior is very similar, but I'll, I'll follow up again with that with an email. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Of course, you can also reach out to uh, myself or Andy or, or any of us after, after the presentation concludes if you wanna have um, additional dialogue about anything. Uh, but thank you, Andy, and everyone have a great afternoon.